My name's Dave Smith. As construction workers, not just as construction workers, as trade unionists, we've realised for a long time that uh, if you stand up for workers' rights, if you stand up for the most basic things, like, you know, actually getting your wages at the end of the week after you've done a week's work, if you stand up for health and safety uh, on a site, or for equality on a site, sometimes the employer don't like it. But whenever we talk about blacklisting, we were always told it was nonsense. We were exaggerating it, and it was a complete conspiracy theory that wasn't really true. Fifteen years ago, in Manchester, a group of electricians who just gets, kept getting sacked time and time again said, we've had enough. And they stood on a picket line in Manchester for three years to try and expose the blacklist. And this is my file. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. But I'll say one thing. It brought a tear to my eye when I saw so many more comrades on that film. But it's also proud, actually, to know that the first demonstration that ever took place on behalf of blacklisting workers took place in this very city. I remember a boy that lives in Gladwell. So we all came up to Dundee for that day. And they came from all over Britain for that meeting. It was the forerunner on the battle against blacklisting. And my good colleague Stuart here set that up in Dundee along with the local Trades Council. So we've got to accept it was some occasion. We didn't know how it would grow or how it wouldn't grow, but it certainly grew arms and legs. But what, what I want to start off with and just say to you is, how did blacklisting come about? Blacklisting came about after the First World War. There had been the Russian Revolution and there had been the problems in Ireland. And the ruling class at that time, along with leading industrialists, had this feeling that after the war, people would look for better housing. You know, believe that or not, that's what they thought. <laughs> they then brought out, under the auspices of the Economic League, a blacklist that went right through workers, not just construction workers at that time, because if anybody can think back to the miners, they were all private mines at that particular time, it wasn't nationalised. And then we had a problem against them, their particular pit owner. The leader of that dispute would be sacked. But unfortunately in these days, you weren't just sacked, you lost your house because houses were associated with the mine owners. And the same went for farm workers. Because they knew they needed the coal for the industry and they needed the farm workers to feed the people that were building these industries. So that's where it started. A massive campaign by, you know, industrialists to make sure they had no problems on jobs. Then it comes up to the Second World War. And after the Second World War, with the introduction of a Labour Party, there was one of the biggest housing booms ever to be known. There was also the rebuilding of factories. So that economically said, we will need to keep on top of this because some of these will be coming back here looking for things, wanting this. Trade unionism was really taken off in a big way. Then we come along to my era, Stuart me. We are both 73, if you like, 47 kids that were born just after the war. We became electricians. And I worked with a company, 1962. And in 1968, I was sacked. I had the audacity to say that people should have Wellington boots for working in the rain. Now think about that. I was only 21 years old. But I didn't know I was blacklisted. I just got bumped. My file that I've looked at it since, my blacklist file, <coughs> at 21 year old I had to leave Edinburgh, because that's where I was born before I moved to Glasgow, to find work. 46 of the major industrialists in this country were members of the Economic League, 
So therefore, your opportunity for work was narrowed. Now, once you take that on board and realise that, people that are working in this town just now were blacklisters. We then, because of my nature, I believe in trade union, I believe in politics. I like that side of things. I had to go to Canada for a job. Well, that, uh, I like, I quite liked it there, but you weren't there. I went to go near to stay. I went to shipyards. I didn't want to work in the shipyards. I was a contracting construction electrician. But sometimes you could get a wee bit in, in the back door. Stuart and me met each other uh, down the road, a company down the road at Moss Farm, working for Shell. I took the shop Stuart's job. We had a two week dispute. You know what it was for? Not working in the rain. And I don't mean rain, I'm talking about weather that we can sometimes get. And this company said, we'll supply you with these waterproof jackets. He says, they're for taking you to the job, not for working in. The industry, as we knew it, was riddled with people with arthritis, pleurisy, rheumatism, for working in the conditions that were expecting us to work in. Now think of this. Three people a week were dying in the construction industry. Now just think about that. Three people a week dying in the construction industry. We had to try our best to get health and safety up to an area that was, what would you say, a par with how it should be. We eventually got paid up because the job came to an end. If you accepted that, you were redundant, you went. And I was looking about trying to get a job elsewhere, but I couldn't get one anywhere. And I found my blacklist form when we applied for them. And it had Jake McLeod, National Insurance Number, Dave Buff, Electrician, NAAP. I just wonder what that is. NAAP. And you know, he's sort of saying, nah, what does that mean? Is that what it meant? Not at any price. <laughs> now, think about that. I had just been screwed off totally from any major industrial contract. Now, I could go away in a wee corner so fix an hands. But I felt my skills deserve more than that. When one really considers it seriously, blacklisting, as the film showed you, created suicides. Friends yours. And I can get a most of that. Because they were real people. Now people will look back and say, but you must have caused bother, you must have been this, you must have Oh, of course we caused bother, we were trade unionists. We wanted to live properly, we wanted to be in jobs that were decent. We wanted a decent wage. We wanted terms and conditions were satisfactory for my sons growing up. Now think about this. I was a married man at the time with two young kids. I'm in the house this day, just after the job at was born, when a rock comes to the door. And my young son runs to the door. And this lad says, that's for your father. The letter. And I took the letter in, and the letter says, You are dismissed back from such and such. Right? I was sacked because of that dispute. Nobody else got that letter handed to them, only the shop steward. Now, just let's think of this a health and safety representative going about his work, going about decently trying to improve the facilities and improve the working conditions ends up sacked for doing that. Bearing in mind that three construction workers a week were dying. Scaffolding no properly fixed. Holes in the ground. Can any of you might not remember, and most of you are young, you used to get the guys that dug the roads or put the cables in and there would be a six foot trench and they went in there, and you used to hear regular that the trench collapsed and buried these guys alive because they had to show them up properly. We were young and raw. We needed to change that, and we did that. 
But when Peter very, very heavy prayed for it, but the end of the day, <coughs> when he economically left, when World in Action, I don't know if many of you know the World in Action programs that used to be on, they did a thing about blacklisting, putting the pressure on the economically, and they became the Consultative Association, changed their name. 3,200 electricians were on their list. Now you can't credit that. I mean, that was the only honest parts of Edinburgh. Honest parts of the knee together. Couldn't get a job. But we've taken a step further. We've campaigned the two years bitterly, along with many of our friends. It culminated in court cases. And it culminated in these companies hoping it would go away by offering people money. And it started at £3,000 up to £100,000. £100. But you know, we've talked about this many a time. We weren't interested in the financial arrangement that people wanted to do. We were one of the companies that had sent us down the river and blacklisted us and took away many of our good times in life. We wanted to be done. But of course, government don't work that way. The Tory party in the Scottish Parliament said, but if they say sorry, will that be enough? If they say sorry. We were bloated and battered and... But anyway, cut a long story short, that programme that you've watched just now took a long time to do. And I've got to say, I enjoyed that to the extent that I saw my mates again on that film. But I like you, Stuart, finish off with us. <laughs> that was good. I'm Stuart Burton. Um, I've uh, stuck coughing fit. You'll have to excuse me because I just have to live. <laughs> I wasn't going to speak at Dunning. Anyway. I'd like to go a wee bit further than what Jake's just talked about because I've actually got my blacklist for the IC in my pocket. And all it says on their blacklist store was Stuart William Merton, my address, uh, my national insurance number, and the fact that I'm an electrician. And that's it. Nothing else. Uh, no card. Just say that. No card. So, when I look at no card, does that mean I'm on a different computer, or does that mean I've just been put on this blacklist because there's somebody just wanted me on the blacklist because they didn't want me on a construction site? And that's, that's the fact that I'm getting out. I firmly believe that it was a trade union that put me on the blacklist. Right? I'm still a member of a trade union, I'm still believing in trade unionism, but I firmly believe that the WTPU put me on that blacklist. Because when the WTPU had to leave the TUC because of the walking dispute, I wrote a letter to the WTPU and resigned and said, look, I'm sorry, I can't be a member of this union anymore, the South Side of TUC. But I would hope to rejoin my comrades in the future. That wasn't a bad letter, it was a nice letter. <laughs> then I joined what were called the EPIU, which was a new union that Jake was a, a, a member and started in fact, they were all okay. Anyway, and I went down to a job just shortly after that in Aldermaston, which was a, a blankly horrible place because uh, you had all these women who were going to say burn the bomb and all this stuff. And eventually I ended up as a shop shield there. And between me and the pal, we got 98% of the electricians on that job. 
and so on that people well trust in that job to join the EPIU. Now, after that, I was going to this uh, national office, national shop stewards meeting in London. So uh, I attended that. The WPPU voted to be excluded from this meeting. Before we got there, by the way, because we were a wee bit late and, and I managed to get there. But, and then again, after that, I had another meeting, um, a bit waited or something, and the WPPU official said, you can't attend this meeting because you're APIU and we represent all the electricians in the construction industry. I said, no, you don't. Yes, you do. Said, no, you don't. You don't represent me. Because I sent you a letter to sign it. But then I said, look, I've got a book here. All these electricians are paid voluntarily their union contribution to the EPIU. That's the only reason you've got any members is because the employers are paying the contribution, which they did under the GIB system. The employers were actually paying the WDPU the union contributions every week. So, what I'm actually getting at is here is, I'm going further to take because I actually think there's a lot of um, trade union officials, three different trade unions, who are heavily involved in blacklisting people. Yeah. And it's got to be sorted. And we, need, we, we really need a big inquiry into that. The United Union have said they're going to have a, huh, uh, an inquiry into that. I hope they do, because there has been officials named and papers like private eye that didn't care if I get sued or not. But, but nobody's ever sued them for it. So when they say, when the name names and not name it doesn't, and you've got to sue, it's true. So we need, we need to get back into this and, 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 and sort out these people that, that totally misrepresented the workers. That's what they did. I mean, I, 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 I've got a union official over here and all his grievance, and all of a sudden, my name's thrown on this blacklist, saying we don't really want him on a construction site because he might go as a brother. That's it, that's it. Thank you. life 
And I just wondered that here you had a young woman going out supporting CAD and a police undercover and she fell in love with her. And they spent two years together. And one morning she got the boys off. He's away back to the police. But he got all the information he required. And at this very moment in time, the miners in Scotland have been allowed through the Scottish Parliament to have a research into police involvement in their dispute 40 years ago. Wow. Now how that will go I don't know, but the report's coming out shortly. And I should imagine it will be hard hitting. And can I just finish with this, when you're talking that subject? They went round all the local pits, Fife, Lock Gally, all the places, and they were in Lock Gally. And there was a hundred and odd miners came along, victimised miners, sacked miners. And there was one young chap sitting there that nobody knew. And they said to themselves, look at who that is. And the guy only had one leg. This young lad was mowing down. He was only a young lad at the time. Just took his girlfriend home and he was coming back to his own house. And they used to race these big lorries full of coal through their pit village at night. And they ran into him. And they lost a leg. And nobody was ever charged. Now think about that. That was the state's involvement in the mining industry. A lot young lad that didn't even work in the pits. <coughs> So he said, I want my time in court, and I can understand that, but I take your point. Thank you so much. No, thank you.